Great, thank you very much. Okay, well let's uh, let's get going then. Um, so this uh, this after after a relatively long break, let's talk rules. Um, the last one we did was the first referee. Um, so this is now to look at the second referee, uh, and I link the scorer to this because obviously uh, the two roles are very close to uh, intertwined. But uh, when I looked at it, I didn't put the scorer too much into this because um, in a, in essence it could be a whole it will be a whole session all on its own. So um, we'll, we'll cover the scorer in more depth um, next time. OK, so what's the purpose of this session? It's to look at rule 24 and a bit of 25. Uh, we'll look at the rule text. We'll consider some guide, guidelines and the case book where appropriate. And if there are some video situations, we will look at those as well and we'll consider what those are. So um, I have been clear this time not to use FIVB copyrighted material. So hopefully we won't have any problems getting this uploaded to YouTube. OK, so the refereeing core, we talked about this last time. We said we are all one team. OK, so we have a, a photograph here. I don't uh, mind using this one um, from the World Championships in 2014. And this was the referee team uh, for one particular match. And the ones that we're concerned about in this particular chat are the uh, referees and the scorers. And you can see that for this match, there were three scorers. There was the scorer, the assistant scorer and the reserve scorer. And then there was obviously myself as second referee. And I had my reserve referee who also has a lot of responsibilities around the second referee was also there to, to help us. Uh, I'm just going to, there's somebody in the lobby. So let me just let them back in. OK, so. The composition. So what we're concerned about now is the second referee and uh, the scorer. And. So we are talking about the bench side of the of the court and everything that goes on on that side of, of the court. And as uh, noted just now, if you're in an FIVB world or official competition or, or um, you are likely to have an assistant scorer, um, they are compulsory in those competitions, whereas in our MVL, you might get an assistant score if you're lucky. Um, and uh, you also in official competitions would have a reserve referee uh, there as well. And you might even get a reserve scorer um, as well, just in case there are any uh, problems. Um, We talked about last time about the procedures of um, the refereeing core and rule 22. And I've highlighted here where we talked about how the the, um, the, the referee team works together and, and what you do. So before the match, in pre-match preparation, you have to work together. And as a second referee, you need to support your first referee in this because the first referee is in control of the match. They're in control of the warm up. Um, and they have a lot of stuff to do before the start of the match. So as second referee, you can also be really busy and really help this uh, process go by checking teams against the roster and doing that with the first referee, um, checking teams against the score sheet, again with the first referee, um, checking all of the equipment, and you do this um, together. Now, the FIVB likes to say that the second referee has responsibility for the equipment, but the first referee may wish to get involved um, at this point as well. Certainly around the ball, the ball pressures, making sure that everything is OK, where all the reserve equipment is in case something happens during the match. Um, and then during the match, to ensure that all is working smoothly, know where the match balls are. OK, so uh, if you've got more than one uh, ball in, in use and in uh, senior competition, you have five. So you, you have the, the one that's in play and you have four which are out with uh, ball retrievers if you have them or uh, they're in a cart um, behind the uh, service zones. Now in the MVL we have two, we have a minimum of two balls for a match. Um, you've, got a, you've got one in play and you've got a spare and because of the COVID addendum um, that ball is, is used. So just you need to make sure that you've checked both balls, they're both the same and uh, they're both ready to go for the match. Um, and during the match, 
You need to make sure that you are helping with decision making. You're in control of the interruptions. And then towards the end of the match, at the end of the match, you're there for checking the score sheet and um, obviously signing it as well. So the rules clear that only first and second referees may blow a whistle during the match. OK, um, and. So telling me somebody's in the lobby. Um, so the first, the, so you can both blow a whistle during the match um, and. You need to understand that when you blow the whistle, you need to then obviously give information to the teams and and the process for the first and second referee is um, is different when you when you whistle a fault. OK, so the first referee, um, the, the first thing that the information that's given is this is the is the team to serve and then the reason the the, the reason for the fault, whereas with the second referee, you are signaling the reason for the fault. And then you are waiting for the first referee to then signal the team to serve, which you will then um, uh, then then re repeat. OK, so. You need to be you need to be clear because obviously when the second referee makes uh, uh, stops play for for a fault, um, the teams are used to the whistle coming from the first referee side. So therefore, you need to be a little bit sharper with your whistle, particularly if you're whistling something like penetration under the net. Because into the opponent's court, because that is a safety um, fault that you are whistling and you want play to stop. So you just need to be that little bit um, uh, more focused and a little bit sharper with your whistle when that happens. And as I mentioned, uh, you need to then signal the nature of the fault the player at fault um, and then the um, team to serve following the first referee. Now, it's not always necessary to signal the player at fault, um, particularly where it's a net contact and you might have a multiple a multiple block, collective block um, and more than one player may have contacted the net within that block. And therefore, um, when when players um, challenge this situation, they, they always say, who? Yeah. Now it's not necessary to say it was this player or this player or this player. One of one of the block touched the net. So in this case, it's not easy because you might be indicating the wrong player, the player that clearly didn't touch the net, and then you may have some difficulties. So if you've got a, any doubt, don't indicate the player. All you need to say is one of you touched the net or contacted the net. If it's something else. For example, the ball into the antenna, ball out. Um, then you just need to be clear about which way the ball is going. And you can see the fault, but you may not be absolutely certain whether the ball went off the attack into the antenna or off the block into the antenna. And you've got some people to help you. You've got you've got a line judge that you hope is watching. Um, that may be there to help you. And also the first referee may have a, a, a sight on this one. So if you need help, get the help. OK, so um, that's just uh, just there. And we'll come back to that as we go through. Um, so. Uh, sorry about that one. So into the second referee, so rule um, rule 24. So uh, the second referee performs their duties standing opposite um, uh, standing outside the playing court near the post on the opposite side of the court to the first referee. So you're what the Americans call the down referee or the referee on the on the floor. And that gives you responsibility and authority over everything on your side of the court. Once the first referee is up there on the stand, they can see what's going on, but they can't really influence it without using their whistle. Whereas the second referee, you've got a bit more freedom to be able to uh, help out. Let's think about the process. So before the match, um, obviously we need to know what the protocol is that we're uh, um, using for that particular match. And it changes because each tournament could be different and they might want different things done. But in general, the protocol is the same as you would normally get with some slight tweaks. So 
when we look at the protocol for the, say, for the National Volleyball League, for example, um, you're starting at 30 minutes prior to the start of the match. So this is one of the reasons why it's really important to get to the venue before this point in the in the protocol so that you are changed and you're ready, you're, you've settled down from maybe a hectic journey or whatever, you, you've relaxed a bit and you're ready to go. You've done some pre-checks as well before you get to the protocol. Like um, it's not really a great thing to check the net at 30 minutes before the start of the match to find that the net is at the wrong height or it needs tightening, which changes its height or something else. So you want to have done that before you get to the point of actually checking the net, which is the start of the protocol. It tells the teams the protocol is about to start. OK, so that is why um, you need to get there a little bit earlier and then um, you need to check the height of the net. And the process is that the second referee checks the height and the first referee oversees this process. OK, so the first referee doesn't go, oh, well, off you go. You go and check the height of the net and they go and do something else. You do it together. OK, um, so. You do it um, by first going to the middle of the court. And then you go to the referee, the first referee side, and then you go back to um, the second referee side. And you can use this for, for a number of things just to make sure that the, the net is correct in the middle, that you've got no more than your two centimetres at either end. And you can also use um, this time to make sure that the antenna are fixed properly, that they're vertical um, and do those checks at the same time and give yourself a little bit of time to do this. So you may want to start this at 32 minutes or, or so before the start. OK, so once you've checked the height of the net and you're happy with it, then you can start thinking about the other responsibilities you've got before the start of the match. So the um, FIVB guidelines say that the second referee should take possession of the match balls and check that they are all the same. So the same manufacturer, um, you need to check that the ball is on the homologated list from the FIVB, which is used by um, the Volleyball England in the MVL. OK, so um, you need to make sure that the ball, that all of the balls are the same. So they're the same. They might be the same make and they might look the same, but they could be different. So you may have the Mikasa MVA 200, which is the standard, uh, the, the, the ball that's shown in the uh, picture here. But there's a there's a ball which is very close to that, which is the MVA 300, which is also allowed. But what you can't do is you can't have an MVA 200 and an MVA 300 as your match balls. They both have to be the same. So you need to make sure that you check this. OK, and the same goes for the V200W, which is the current FIVB match ball um, and its various options, which I think are the V300. So you just need to check to make sure that you've got the right ball there with you. OK. You need to make sure they're the same colour, for example. So, for example, we know that some teams have the green and yellow MVA 200 ball, which is a CEV Champions League ball. Um, and um, if you get that ball, I believe is not um, not acceptable for the for the MVL because it's not on the list because it's a special ball only in the CEV. So if you've got a team that's using it, you just have to make sure that um, that you know what's um, what's what with the with the ball. And we would check that the circumference, the weight and the pressure are all the same. And we don't check the circumference of the balls. Um, if you were in an international competition, you would do. Uh, you'd also check the weight. Um, what you do before an international competition, I think this is a bit strange, but what you do is you get all of the balls which are going to be used in the matches throughout the tournament. Um, and that could be uh, 40 plus balls. And what you do is you, you put them all to the right, to the same pressure, and then you weigh them and you weigh them in groups. So because the ball has to be between 260 and 280 grams, then you would weigh one group between 260 and 265, one group between 265 and 270, and one group between 270 and 280. And you give them an ABC marking, and then you'd, you'd filter all the balls into these various groups. And then you would make sure that when you came to a match, that all your match balls came from group C, group B or group A, so that they are all the same. 
Okay, and that's why we talk about um, the, the match balls having to have the same weight. And pressure, um, we know that we also, when we check the balls, we might use a digital gauge or we might use a, a, a manual a, a, a dial gauge. Give yourself a bit of leeway. So don't always pump, put the ball to 325 or, or leave the ball at 300 because your gauge can be out. So if you took a midpoint, say 310 or 315, then you've got at least 10 either side of that point in case your gauge is not working as well as it probably could do. Because we don't, we very rarely check the gauges to make sure that they're all the same. And they do give different pressures if you use a, a couple of different gauges. You might get the different pressure for the ball. So just give yourself a bit of a bit of leeway when you're checking the balls. And then you've got the difficult task of, of uh, well, you would have if you had these three, um, you, of having to brief your scorer. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to make sure that your scorer knows what they're doing and you're trying to gauge that from their responses to your questions. And you, within the MVL, you could get anybody scoring. You might get someone who's never done it before. Um, hopefully not, but um, my last match, we did have a scorer that had, hadn't done it for, for a considerable time. Um, so they needed a refresher. So when you're talking to the score and you're briefing the score, you need to say, you know, do they understand the score sheet and how it works? Do they need your help? Um, have they got the team roster and, and have they completed the pre-match details so that you the toss can be conducted, for example? Um, and then check with them that what processes you're going to use during the match. So do they know that they are going to announce the substitutions? Do they know the process you're going to go through with the paddles so that they can write the right information down? Do they know whether they are timing the intervals or not? Um, so, you know, the, there is because at the moment we're not using technical timeouts. They don't have to, to, to time those, but they could be timing the intervals for you. Um, the two, two minutes 30 and then the teams can return to the court. Um, how are they going to deal with any problems? How are they going to let you know that there is um, they, they are behind or they don't know what's going? They don't really know what's going on. They need the game to stop because they've lost track of where they are. So how are you going to how are you going to communicate? And do you then need to take any extra steps to support them and to check their work? It's always good when you get a timeout to go and check the score sheet. It's always good between the sets to make sure you've checked the score sheet and you get used to reading it upside down. Um, one of the things that you're checking when you're at a timeout is not just that it's been recorded, but just have a quick look to see who the, who the next server is. So who's serving at the moment, the timeout was called, and who's going to be serving on the opposite side the next time they win the rally? OK, that tells you when the teams go back onto court, whether they've returned to court in the right positions. So it's one of those checks that you're doing as a second referee just to check that everybody is as they should be. And then you get to the to the toss. And you need to be present with the first referee. Um, and it's always good. Make sure you've taken a note of the outcome of the toss. Um, mainly because obviously you know which side is going to be serving and, and, and so forth for that. But also then you can check that the right information has been, been given to the scorer and you, it's actually been recorded correctly. And you need to double check that. So once you've done the toss, you've got the presentation and the official warm up. Um, and obviously for the presentation, we always know that the second referee is always on court B. OK, so as the scorer faces the court, you're always to the right hand side. And at this time in the in the uh, in the presentation, obviously both teams can should be in their uh, playing uniforms and um, you're just checking to make sure that everything's all right. And this is also a good point to double check that nobody is um, put on compression. That's a different color. And, as, and this is working with the team. As the a, as a first referee and second referee, that you can then look at the team and make sure that you've done your checks. Are you all happy with the uniforms and all of those sorts of things? If you haven't already done it before you get to the toss. OK. So, the presentation and official warm up, then you've got um, as soon as the official warm up um, is over, 
the teams will, um, sorry, as soon as the presentation is over, the official warm up will start. And that is the point at which you need to get the lineup sheets. So you need to get them straight from the coach. Um, and that is the same within the um, within the playing protocol in the MVL. Uh, it's 12 minutes before the start. And at 12 minutes before the start, you need those lineup sheets. So what you need to do is you need to make sure the coach knows that that's the point they are going to complete the lineup sheet and give it to you. Don't let them take part in the official warm up. Don't let them disappear off somewhere, make a cup of tea, whatever it is, whatever they do, make sure you've got that lineup sheet at 12 minutes before the start. And if they say, oh, no, I'm thinking about it, you say, no, I'm sorry, coach, you need to have it done now. OK, you need to uh, need to get them into that process of 12 minutes before the start. As soon as the official warm up starts, the lineup sheets have to be submitted. Not after that, not after the official warm up, not two minutes to go before the start, not when both teams are on the court waiting to start and you still haven't got the lineup sheet. Not all of those times, 12 minutes before. And when you get to a change of sets, you need to be you need to be putting a little bit of pressure on and saying, you know, at that interval, have you got your lineup sheet ready yet? And this is where if you've got a decent uh, a coach that's on the ball, they would have got their assistant coach or somebody in their, their bench personnel if they've got some to already write out the lineup sheet. And then all they have to do then is sign it. The coach only has to sign up, sign the lineup sheet. OK, they don't have to write it out. So if somebody else has written it out, then they, all they have to do is sign it to say that is what they want. And if it's if it's not clear, show it to the coach and say, coach, is this what you want? Because you need to double check that and make sure you, you've got it. So you need to make sure that there are all the numbers are clear. And if they are not or they've been overwritten or whatever, then you need to go back to the coach and say, coach, do you mean this number? It, what is this number? Yeah. Make sure it's signed um, and try not to get into the process where a coach says, can you just use the one from last set? If that happens and you've still got it and you haven't torn it up, take it over to the coach, put it in front of them and say, is this what you want? OK, and make them agree. Yeah, it just helps you with your, your checks. Because we all know that once we get into a game, a check uh, uh, is going to cause us a bit of difficulty. So to avoid discrepancies, you need to use the pre-printed the, the team sheet and it should be written out and sometimes it may not be the MVL um, form, but hopefully it will be. Against what's written on the score sheet, double check, particularly numbers. Check that team sheet and the score sheet and the numbers against the players you have on the court. And then when you have your lineup sheets, check your lineup sheets against your player roster and then check your lineup sheets against the court so that you get to know who are the players that are going to be starting this match. And making sure that then you don't have any problems. OK, so I'm going to jump around here. So this is 24.3, so we'll come back to 24.2 in a minute. But um, the 24.3, and the reason I say it here is because at the start of each set, change of courts and in the deciding set, wherever necessary, the second referee checks the actual positions of the players in the court correspond to those on the lineup sheet. OK, so this is your primary responsibility to make sure that there are no discrepancies identified. OK, and once the accuracy of the lineup sheet is the coach's responsibility. Both the scorer and the second referee have a requirement to check it prior to the start of the set. OK, so you're just checking and if there's anything that you're not uncertain about, you go back to the coach. So during the warm up, identify the starting players that this helps and, and you can note at that time, especially who the setter is and whether the team captain is in the starting lineup. And if they're not, then ask the coach to the number of the game captain before the lineup check. So that when you do the lineup check, you can indicate that player to the first referee without then having back going back to the coach and saying, coach, who is your um, game captain? So just a quick recap on positions. Um, and, and I put this on this way. So I've got my lineup sheet um, upside down, and this is how I check, this is how I check the court. 
So when I check the teams on the court, I turn my lineup sheet upside down. And then the players on the court will be exactly as per my lineup sheet. OK, now you all have your own routines, but that's the one that um, that works for me. So I know exactly that I'm look what I'm looking at is the same as my, my lineup sheet. OK. So discrepancies, and this is just a recap on rule seven. So if you do have a discrepancy, so let's say this issue where we've got number two should be at position two and on the court we've got number eight. OK, now if that happens, the solution is always to replace. Player that is num number eight on the court with the correct player number two. Now, if the team then say, yeah, but I want number eight. Then you have a substitution and this is a time when you use the signal substitution. So everyone knows that this is a substitution. This is not just replacing one player with another. This is a substitution. And then number two can leave the court and number eight can enter. Hopefully they will use the paddles, which they have in, if they're mandatory in the competition. At that point, as second referee, go to the score and make sure it's been recorded correctly at zero zero. The most obvious problem that this then causes, and it happens quite regularly, is that later in the set, the coach will forget that number two has been substituted off the court. And when they are introduced, them, they'll try and substitute them again. And you need to just be aware that that's what's going on. So we've got a uh, video um, here just to have a quick look at. So this is the issue that we're talking about. This is about doing your pre-match checks. OK, so what we've got here, we've got a situation where we've got a team roster that has two Liberos, number 11 and number 16. OK. So we are expecting um, this particular team to present two Libros in the presentation. One next to the captain and the other at the end of the row. So here is the team lining up at the presentation and we can clearly see that number 16 is wearing a blue playing shirt. Now she's then introduced into the match as a substitute later in the set. Now the scorer at this point is going, this is impossible. OK. And the second referee is showing the coach that the player number 16 is on the score sheet as a libero. That's what they signed for, and therefore she cannot take part in the match as anything but a libero. Okay, this is quite an embarrassing situation to be in, particularly both for the coach and for the referees, because the referees clearly did not do their pre match check. Okay, they should have spotted this early in the process and dealt with it. And if they'd have done that, they would have said to number 16, you're on the sheet as a libero, you need to change your shirt. And she could have had plenty of time to go and change the shirt and then she could have been part of part of the match. But as it happened in this case, unfortunately, she was unable to take uh, part in the match apart from as a libero. And I suspect the team are probably not going to use her either. Um, so she may not get any any part of the game. So it's always important to make those checks. OK, I think we've got a, another, an, another just check this is this is another one. OK, so in this case we have got helpfully the person that's got the video and we'll go back to the start here. Actually, let's go back to the start and just hold it there for a moment. So we've got a lineup sheet that says that the positions of the players from the back of the court forward should be 1, 14, 6, 2, 7, 11. OK. And on the court, we have got uh, positions, the players, we've got number six is off for the Libro. So we've got six, uh, two, seven, eleven, one, fourteen. So we've got a situation where um, the team has lined up with the front and the back rows transposed. OK. And the second referee has not seen this. Um, and the scorer obviously hasn't looked either um, because at Nort Nort we're happily playing a match with these players in the wrong positions. So let's see how it goes. 
So they win, um, they win the rally. They started on reception. So if they started on reception, number seven should now be going to serve. And we've got number 14. Okay. So, so we've got seven. And let's see, do we get no? Nobody's noticed. The scorer isn't checking who the scorer is, the uh, server is, because obviously they would have uh, stopped the rally and said, this is um, this is the wrong server. So we're now on recep reception. Rally goes. So the, the white team won the point, went to serve. We've still got 14 at one, when she should be at, um, at uh, four. Because they now win the rally, so now number two should be going to serve. We won't worry about the fact she's wearing the wrong colour compression. I'm sure the referees have sorted that out before the start of that. Um, so now should be number two, and it's number one. And we've got the second referee is now, the score is now identified that's the wrong server. The second referee retreated back to the scorer's table to find out what was going on. And now they have um, decided that uh, the team is out of uh, as, as competed a rotation fault, and they're going to to check. So it's quite clear now at this point that the situation occurred from the start of the the match. So the team in black needs to be corrected in their positions. Um, they will lose the two points they've scored. Obviously, the team in white will score another point, which is which will take them to three. So the match should restart at three zero. Just see how this one. It's a long discussion now as to what's gone on with the scorer and the second referee. So this really shouldn't take too long because all you need to do is to show the lineup sheet to the captain and say, right, captain, the, pl the player at one should be uh, number two, I think it is. Um, and therefore, everyone should position themselves off number two. And then you take away the two points that they've scored and get on with the get on with the match. So let's see whether they how this corrects. So number two has now gone to uh, so we need number six on the court, don't we? Yes. So here comes number six. So the Libro's got to leave. No, no, they can't. No, they can't have the. Now, in this instance, what you need to do is you would need to ask the you, you ask the Libro to leave and get the right player on the back row. You know, in this instance, you can't just allow the Libro to. So the Libro, because the Libro is on for the on for uh, number um, was on for number six that they thought. Yeah. Now I question. You know, we could uh, have a discussion here as to whether we would expect the Libro to be off the court for that point, or whether we would expect the Libro to be on the court. It's noticeable here that the actual score hasn't been reverted to zero. Okay. So this is an interesting case. One to one to look at. So let's stop it there. If I can. Okay. And let's go to you and say, right, okay, do you think the Libro should have left the court? Well, the positions need to be reverted to what they should be. So if the Libro is off court, of course the Libro needs to be off court, no? Yeah, but in, in this instance, so the Libro is on the court for number six. OK, and they should and if they were being if, if the play was um, the team had lined up correctly, they would be on the off the they would be on the court for number 11. 
but because they're on the court for the wrong player, would you say to them, right, okay, now I need I need number six to come back into the court. The Libro should leave. Six, you now to be now need to be front court. Number eleven needs to be back court. And then would you allow the Libro then to replace number eleven? Or would you say, well, the Libro is is the only player that would be in the right place, apart from the fact they're on the court for the wrong player. My view is the Libro should leave and the team should should set themselves in the right positions. And then after one rally, the Libro should then be allowed to enter. But I'm open to I'm open to challenge on that. I, I don't know a right or wrong answer on this one. Um, Glenn, have you got a view? Um, I was about to come in and say, I mean, I, I could also see it the other way. Uh, and that is that the Libro is on court for the player who is in position six. Yeah. Right. Um, regardless of the fact that that player is a different number. So you could argue that the Libro is on the court in the right position. They have just done it for the wrong player numbers. Yes. Right. So you could argue it both ways. Um, and yes, I don't even think there's anything like that in the case book either. Right. So. Yeah, a bit of a bit of a challenge. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Rita, are you going to say or, or Nacho? Yeah, I, I would in? agree with your viewpoint there because at the end of the day, there should be a Libero control sheet which shows what yep. player swapped with the Libero. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lenny? If I can interject, it seems to me that when we recorrect things in the right position, we basically uh, uh, erase everything that's gone wrong. So starting from that position, it feels like the liberal should be allowed to come in from for anybody in the back as if nothing had happened because we, we write it all off and they should lose the point. They didn't lose the points, but yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry, Nick, I was going to say the um, if there's an assistant scorer with a liberal control sheet, then you know exactly what was going on. Yeah. Um, if there isn't a liberal control sheet, then are we also facing the potential double jeopardy of uh, they've lost their points and now they're going to have to have their middle player in the back court uh, in an unfamiliar position. Yeah. Uh, and is that two penalties for the price of one? Yeah. I, 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 I take that argument as well. So uh, I, I think this is one of those situations whereby um, as a referee, you would, you, you, you make a decision. It's, it's, it's one for you to decide, and you can argue either way. Yep, you can. And, and, and I think all the the argument on both sides is is perfectly valid, and I don't think there should be there will be any query um, against you for making either decision, personally. Yeah. So in I this think, case, in this case, I think, Nick, my I, only thing would be as long as you can explain your decision, right? Logically, then there is no argument. Uh, Irma? Um, I was going to say I agree with Lenny, but the FIVB rules are, you know, you have to apply the rules. So you have to, if you have a control sheet of the Libero and you know where he, she is, you have to exchange the players. Then for one rally, the Libero has to be out. That's what the rules say. So I agree with Lenny. It's like making two um, things back um, bad calls for the um, team, but the rule says we have to change the Libero if we understand we made a mistake and put them back into places first, and then one rally later, they can change. But, but here, here, here is a different argument then. Let's say, for example, that you had two players in the back court and they happen to be in the wrong position. So let's say players in positions five and six were the wrong way around. And the Libro then went on for a player in position six. Then they've gone on for a number. And in that case, yep, when you do that switch, uh, it's a number. But then they're out of position. Right. So I think if you look at it from different points of view, you probably come to different answers. 
Okay. Um, I can I can see there's a yeah. Is, it, is somebody else got their hand up? Is somebody with a hand up that's that I, I can't see on my screen at the moment? Um, I think I think it's me. Okay. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a liberal control sheet, that's okay. You can use it, uh, but at least in the majority of the matches I referee, there's no control sheet. So what I would do is uh, what just the same we do at the beginning of the match. Get the starting players lined up correctly. Get off the lever. <coughs> get the six starting players on the on the court in the correct positions, and then if they want to exchange the libero, allow it if they want. Okay, yeah, fair enough. That's a, a good point. So as I say, I, I I'm not going to give you. I'm not going to say there's a right or a wrong here because you know I, my my personal view is I would ask the libero to leave, but that's that's my personal personal view on this one. So right. um, I, I think the the other point of it is is actually. Um, that in this particular match, that the the, the referee hasn't uh, applied the, the the approach for dealing with um, the wrong the the, the the position the rotation fault um, and identified from because it's quite clear from this one as to where this must have started from. They're right at the start of the set, so it couldn't have been at any other point. You know, they haven't the front and back row haven't suddenly take. Uh, received the ball for one point, attacked with it for one point, and then suddenly decided to switch front to back. They, you know, that's, you know, they haven't suddenly decided, oh, well, hang on a minute, we, we, all of us back row players should be front row, and all of us front row players should be back row. So in this situation, the, the referee should clearly have said, I can identify exactly when this happened, and this was the start of the set. So therefore, we should have resumed on 3-0. Uh, and then, and then kept going from there. Um, with, with the official should be penalized twice yeah. him because you're going to penalize twice you're going to take two points plus you're going to tell them libero is not coming in and you start actually from beginning so i think you should able to well you should allow to uh, make substitution with the libero here, here here is another thought right because what we're saying is the wrong players on the on the court okay so therefore we revert the score to zero it's still at that point 2-0. Get the Libra off of the court. Put the players in the correct positions. Give the team the point and then let the Libra come back in. So at that point, you have prevented the double jeopardy. Yeah. Right. And you have allowed the Libra to come back in after a point has been scored. So you've got a completed rally because you've yep. got a point. Yeah. You... OK. I like, yeah. I like John Glynn, I do. That's why that's why you're the head of referees. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying any more then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving a different point of view. But I, I, I mean, after yeah. having all those discussions and yeah, then yeah. having the, the idea of looking at the Libra control sheet, um, yeah. the thought just came to me that, you know what, that makes the best sense. Yeah. to get to, to resolve this situation yeah okay yeah thanks for that thank you for that yeah. bit. that's um that's that's really good and um so I, I just put this one up there so that you could just see what sort of situations you come into and now i've experienced situations of wrong players um but not at not not so clear as this one in terms of of teams being quite so quite so far out um, but they too take and all, these situations take a long time to sort out. Yeah. And you know, my, my experience, and, and and Lenny will know this because Lenny and I were in Serbia at the University Games in 2009, and we had a match that was delayed by 11 minutes because of an error that happened at something like 9-9 in the fifth set, just yeah. after the teams had switched courts. And there'd been a there'd been a timeout, and there'd been a substitution, and it the scorer was completely had no clue what was going on, and they didn't stop the match immediately. They allowed the game to go on a couple of points before they immediately put their hand up and said, I "Don't know what's going on. I don't know who should be where, who's serving, who's not, who has served, who hasn't served," um, and it takes a bit of a time to sort out. And in that situation, all we did is eventually we got to the point where we said, look, 
coach, what do you think the score is? Coach, what do you think the score is? And both coaches said what they thought the score was. They were both the same score. We said, right, do we agree that's the score? Coach, who is your next server? And they said, it's this player, it's that player, and that's how we carried on. And, and we had to take that view of, of a way of getting out of the situation. Mm -hmm. So trying to, th this is a point of, this one is around not checking properly at the start of the um, the, the the set, which is which is a fundamental for the for the referee, yeah. And so so, but there are things do happen like this that are that that cause those situations. Lenny, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say at the higher level games, we have more tools available to us. So at the Universiade or uh, a CEV competition, you will have an assistant scorer and you will also have stats people. So the stats guys will know what the score should be. And if they're both agreeing on their tracking and the coaches agree, then you've got the best outcome you're going to get. But it's a lesson to say that, you know, scorer, not sure, stop the game, stop the game now so we don't have to unpick it and unravel it and go all the way back. Um, everybody makes mistakes. Some of the things uh, that we've all seen in a volleyball match about wrong players being uh, on court, uh, players not being on the roster. Uh, I have seen the teams uh, line up uh, and be checked by the referee. Uh, and then for some obscure reason, while he's checking the other side, uh, the front court middle has decided to change positions with the back court middle and carried on and it, it got spotted when they came to serve but how could they do that they surely must be used to playing beside each other and they know who they're behind in a national team so players do strange things coaches do strange things so why should scorers and referees be any different <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that right we're gonna we're gonna move on so because we've got a bit bit more to talk about so um I think this is a, a, a different, and no, that's the same one. So let's let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so um, the process of checking the lineup sheets and and your and your um, process before you start the match should be relatively consistent all the time. So the way to the way to do it is to check the serving team first. Avoid carrying the match ball whilst you're checking lineup sheets. Just have the lineup sheet. Yeah. Check leave it on the scorer's table. It would be a good place. Or, or you can leave it by the post, but scorer's table is nice. Yeah, more, more tidier, shall we say. Check the serving team first. Okay. Make sure the players are in clearly the right position. This is not a time for them to try and line up in some formation that they've decided might confuse the opposition. Because as a second referee, your job is to make sure they're in the right positions. So if you've got any doubt as to where they are, mm -hmm. you say to them, come on, guys, I need three players in the front. I want three players in the back. Where you stand after that is entirely up to you. But now this is what I want. Yeah. And, and use your whistle to get it. You know, if you can't see the players' numbers properly, get them to turn to face you. You know, be, be clear. Make sure you've done that check, even if it's quite obvious. You know, you think, oh, no, I've seen that player all the way through. They've been wearing that shirt. You don't know. They might have nipped when you haven't been watching. They might have nipped, changed the shirt into their reserve shirt or something. They might have a different number on it. It's been done. So check and do that check and make sure that you know the players are in the right place. Once you've checked, allow the Libro to enter and don't allow the Libro to enter at any time before then. If the Libro is on the court when you come to check the lineup, get the Libro off the court. Make a big thing of it. Libro, you must leave player who's now in the warm-up area, you must come into the court. Make sure they understand, because they won't do it again if, you, if you're if firm with them. If you just allow that to go, then the next game they'll do it and they'll do it and they'll do it. You need to make sure that you're in control. Then check your receiving team. Indicate the game captains if, if the team captain's not um, on the court as you uh, need to. Issue the match ball to the serving team. You check the benches are correct and that the reserve players are either seated on the bench or in the warm up area. Check the scorer is ready and say, scorer, are you ready? OK, and then you can move to your starting position on the reception side. And then finally, 
you can give the signal to say that the match is ready to start or the set is ready to start. OK, if you're lucky enough to have audio communication device, then you don't have to use the signal. You can just say ready. Um, there's no need to use your hands to support the fact that you just said ready. OK, so but just go through that process and make sure you're clear. You have checked. You've got the right players because you know the worst thing that can happen to you is getting the wrong players on the court at the start of the set because it could it at the very worst it can mean that a match has to be replayed it might have to be replayed at great cost to either of the teams or to volleyball england or to the authority in charge of the competition and you know that that's a, a big a big deal yeah if if that happens it costs a lot of money. It can cost. I think we had one a couple of years ago now, 2019 or 2018, where we had to, a match replayed and the replay of the match cost something in the region of 700 pounds. So it's a if you get it wrong, then um, by not doing those checks clearly enough, then there's a big, uh, a big fault coming. Yeah. So take a bit of time on this one. Don't just do a perp Cover, you know, a, a sharp glance and say everything's OK. The players wouldn't be in the wrong positions, would they? OK, you can get caught out. OK, so let's go back to the second referee rules and authority. So the second referee is the assistant of the first referee, but they have their own range of di jurisdiction. So should the first referee be unable to continue their work, then the second referee may replace him or her. Well, in actual fact, you will replace him or her. OK, that's your job. And the reserve referee, if you've got one, becomes the second referee. If you don't have a reserve referee, then you're going to have to find someone to do the job. OK, so the second referee may, uh, without whistling, also signal faults outside his or her range of jurisdiction, but may not insist on them to the first referee. You can offer advice. If you're going to offer advice, be clear about it. OK, now the first referee doesn't need advice like, I think that was a double contact or I think that was a catch. Yeah. They can see the play of the ball. What they're looking for advice from you is is other things that you can that you can help with, you know. But if you're going to give that advice, you have to give it clearly. But be aware that certain things that you can do aren't helpful if the first referee has made a decision which is different to yours. So, for example, signaling four contacts when the ball has hit the net band and rebounded into the team. OK, you have to be absolutely certain the ball has not touched the block if there's one there. And we know from challenge that nine out of ten balls that hit the net band contact the block before they come back to the team that's just hit, that made the attack here. OK, and that is because the, the net compresses, the ball moves up and down off the top of the net band and then comes back towards the other team towards the team that's just hit it. So don't be uh, quick on that one of just saying the ball's hit the net band, that's four, because you can make certain that the team, one of the teams will use that to their advantage or attempt to use that to challenge the first referee's decision. So you can give information, but make sure that if you're doing it, you're absolutely certain and um, to do it. Now, most of the things that you can give information about are within your jurisdiction anyway. So you're able to signal the ball in if the first referee is not in a position to see the ball contact the floor. That's within your responsibility. Yeah. So there's no point showing the, the ball in using a finger pointing down because if the first referee hasn't whistled it, you should have whistled it if you think it's in. If you think it's a, an illegal backcourt attack or block or whatever, then you have that response, you have that responsibility to um whistle that fault yeah so there's you you can't give that the only one of those is the potential for the libero overhand finger pass which is then attacked higher than the top of the net in those instances you may wish to just indicate to the first referee that the libero is in the front zone because this is a fault which you cannot whistle it's not within your responsibility so therefore um you need to, that one. You can give information if you if you feel it is necessary to do so. But as I said, be careful with, with this. Um, there will be instances where the team, for example, you know, you you'll see quite clearly that a player makes two contacts. The ball, the, the first referee may be um, completely blinded by by the fact that the ball may have hit a player's arm 
and then the, the middle of their chest when it's the second second ball. So things like that that you might see. With, that's a clear one where you might say, to the fish referee, "Yeah, absolutely. This is one I'm going to help you." With. Okay. Control the web of the scorer. We've talked uh, talked about that. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to them. Yeah, I know. You know, you're going to have to get work outside your comfort zone and have a chat with the scorer at some point. Um, you supervise the team members on the team bench and you report their misconduct to the first referee. Yeah. So this is why you must, in your working practice, make sure you know what's going on in the bench. You control the players in the warm up areas. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a second, uh, to have a reserve referee, then that responsibility is taken by them because they have re responsibility for the control area and managing it. So, um, but, it, but as a, if you haven't got a reserve referee, it's your responsibility. They're in the, the control area, they're outside the playing area, in the control area, your responsibility to manage them. You authorise regular game interruptions and control their duration and reject improper requests. So make sure you know the rules regarding that. You authorise the game interruption. You do not announce it. The scorer announces it, apart from timeouts. So if it's a substitution, the scorer announces it. If it's a timeout, then you announce it. Or you may have a buzzer if you're lucky enough in that situation. You control the number of timeouts and substitutions used by each team, and you report the second timeout and the sixth, fifth substitution to the first referee and the coach concerned. Be clear. Do not just wave in their general direction and hope they've heard you or that it make sure they're looking at you and they understand. Yes, my second one. Yeah. Or fifth, sixth. In the case of an injury, you authorize an exceptional substitution or grant the three minute recovery time. Know the rules around injury. OK. The first thing for injury is substitution, exceptional substitution, and then recovery time, not recovery time. And then if they really are injured, you know, you can you can go through the others. But the first thing you do is if they're really injured, then they're going to stay where they are and everything stops. And you're just going to make a note of the time, et cetera, for the score sheet. And you're just going to get the um, medical help they need to, to deal with it. If they're all, you know, wringing their hand or they landed badly and they think they might have twisted their foot or something, and they and they're just standing there, working out, yeah, am I, am I ready to play? Am I, am I going to play on? Don't know. Then you need to remind, wait, see what the situation is. Then remind the coach. Coach, the player is not allowed to recover on the court, and we're not allowed. We're not waiting for the player to recover on court. You either make a substitution, you call a timeout, and we move on. If there's not, if those are not available to them, then you can authorise the exceptional substitution. And if that's not available, then you authorise the recovery time. And remember, the recovery time is only three minutes for the entire match for one player. So if they use up two minutes in one set, then they can't have more time later. They've only got one minute left. You check the floor condition, mainly in the front zone. Um, if the players are moaning about sweaty floor, um, mopping, that sort of thing, um, a second referee, have a look, you know, see if it really is a problem, because this is a classic example of how a team delays a match. OK, so, you know, get over there, you know, watch, look what's going on and make sure that they're not using the situation. Um, and uh, you supervise the team members in the penalty areas and report their misconduct. Uh, rule change coming here, flag, red flag coming um, in future. There will be no penalty chairs. There are no penalty areas in the in the uh, 2022 rules. Um, the, the player who is expelled must go to the changing room. OK, they're not allowed to stay in the court. Then 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 they can be asked back. At the end of the set by by the team. So uh, so they leave, they leave the control area. Um, so they're not courtside. Um, and obviously, if they're disqualified, then they're going to the change room for the rest of the match anyway. So it's not, a, not an issue. But that's the, the the rule change that's coming in this area. So responsibilities. So during the match, um, you decide whistle and signal penetration onto the opponent's court and the space under the net. So this is a key responsibility. This is a safety issue. OK, understand the rule clearly. If the player contacts the opponent's court with a foot whilst the ball is in play this is a fault okay and it's a fault every single time know the difference between the foot and the player who has encroached the uh, opponent's playing area 
by sliding or whatever, and their feet are still in their own court or their feet are above the ground or off the court. Yeah, it's touch the court. The word is touch. Yeah, and it's a fault. So, uh, you know, don't give in to teams that say, oh, well, no, no one's looking, no one's watching, nobody's interested. Yeah, there for a reason. It's there for player safety. If you've got a player, if you've got a million euro player in the front zone, and you allow players to play, put their feet on in, into the front zone under the under the net, penetrating the opponent's court, and and that player could break their ankle, whatever, lots of things, then this becomes this is a big issue. Positional faults of the receiving team. Okay, so you should have a good understanding of the rules regarding player positions. Okay, so here's a good example: the ball has not been served yet. And the player at um, who is uh, number uh, player at position five um, looks as though by the time that ball is going to be served, they're going to be at position one. Okay, they're well, well out of position. Okay, um, this is a clear fault. Okay, and um, we need to whistle this. Similarly, you can see that this ball has not been served yet, and that the penetrating setter is already in front of. The player at um, at uh, position two. Now, I will say at this point, there is a change coming with position faults. Okay, the 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 player's contact of the floor is changing in terms of its interpretation, but we are not employing those rules in the NBL. Okay, until next season, so you need to use the current rule set and do it. Now, what we're not doing is we're not worried about inches here. Yeah, we're worried about clear players clearly out of position and gaining an advantage. Okay, we've talked about this in positions when we did positions, so I'm not going to label the point. Okay, uh, faulty contact of the player with the net, primarily on the blocker's side and with the antenna on his or her side of the court. Okay, so you've got to remember that this is in the action of playing the ball. OK, so you need to you need to understand that rule. If they are part of a collective block and only one of the players on the block con contacts the ball. All of the players, regardless of how close they are, are part of that block and therefore they're all in the action of playing the ball. You have to understand the action of playing the ball. It's from the moment the player attempts to intercept the ball coming from the opponent, if it's a block, to the moment they regain control having gone through the playing action. So if they're attacking and they attack the ball and then they land and run into the net before they've gained control of their forward momentum, it's a fault if the ball's still in play. It's a fault. Mm -hmm. so just know, you understand what those, um, uh, the rule of interference and how it is. The completed block by back row players or the attempted block by the Libro or an attack hit fault by the back row players or by the Libro. OK, now, being able to see these faults is down to the second referee's understanding of which players are in the back row and whether they're able to see the player at fault. Be careful. And the reason I say be careful is the first referee may have already determined that the ball is not high enough for this to be a fault. So what you need to do in this case is you need to have a quick look at the first referee and if you and and then you can make a judgment between you as to whether this is a fault or not or if you are absolutely certain the ball is high enough then you immediately whistle it you can but as i say you cannot whistle an overhand uh, a, a, an attack hit fault of a ball higher than the top it's coming from an overhand finger pass by um uh, by the Libero, which is not within your responsibility. OK. The contact of the ball with an outside object. Um, so this is the one where the ball gets hits, hits into the roof. Now, normally the first referee whistles this one. OK, but it is within the responsibilities of the second referee and you can whistle it if you wish. Um, but normally the first referee will have done it. And therefore it's, it's, it's one where, you know, you 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 probably will just allow the first referee to take this one. I've not seen too many re second referees do this, okay? Because normally it's obvious, and the first referee has has dealt with it. Um, 
the next one is um, the contact with the ball with the floor if the first referee is not in a position to see. Um, and then the ball that crosses the net plane totally or partly outside the crossing space, the opponent's court, or contacts the antenna on his or her side of the court. So this is the one where you need to be aware of where the attack is coming from. If the attack is on your side of the court, then you need to be able to have both the block and the antenna in your um, line of sight when you get when the ball is contacted so that you can accurately say whether the ball is contacting the antenna or whether it's contacting the block or whether the block is touching the net or touching the antenna or whether the block is trying to block from outside the antenna and they complete the block or the ball misses the antenna completely and goes out because it's been hit into court from outside the antenna. There's a lot to see here, a lot to see. So you need to be in the right position to do this, okay? This is a really difficult one and you need to step back far enough to be able to see it. So if you're always very, very close to the post, you will find this more difficult to do because if you have to move your head up and down to do this, you're going to miss something because your eyes will not be focused at the point they need to be focused. OK, so this is one where just be aware and remember the first referee, first referees, if the ball is hitting hit and it hits the post, it hits the net outside the antenna, the antenna itself, um, the ropes outs, or anything like that. Remember, it's your second referee is going to signal this. So give them the opportunity to signal it. Yeah, their job, not your job. So let the second referee whistle it as ball out. Make sure they get onto the right side, i.e. the side of the team that's at fault. They signal it clearly, they indicate the player that's hit the ball, and then you have the right information then to determine who the side out is. Yeah, and they will follow you. If as a second referee, you see the ball hit the, the net outside the antenna and you whistle out and you're still on the reception side, you're telling the first referee that the ball is out and it's out because of the reception team. When it's not, it's the attacking team which has caused the fault. So in that situation, you need to wait, you need to get across, signal it, indicate it, player, and then you've got the right information. If at that point you do not know, i.e. the ball, whether the ball hit the block in the antenna or the antenna in the block, then that's when I said earlier, you might need to gain more information from a line judge or the first referee, yeah, um, in order to do it. And if it's inconclusive, you have to go with the gut feel. Yeah, because one or other one team is one of the two teams is expecting you to make a decision in their favour. Yeah, but you have to make a decision because the fault has occurred. You can't then just go, well, I couldn't work it out. Let's play it again. Yeah, make your decision. And the final one, the serve ball or the third hit passing over or outside the antenna on his other side of the court. Normally with the serve ball, um, the first referee generally makes makes that decision. The second referee your primary responsibility is not looking at the flight of the ball off the service. Your primary responsibility is, is positions of the receiving team and then looking at the block on the on the serving side because they are now in reception. So, you know, you need to you, you need to forget about thinking, well, I can whistle that one and then start watching the ball because as soon as you start watching the ball, you'll do it during the game and you miss things. So um, one, I, I've not seen a second referee whistle this one either but it's within their responsibilities. So let's have a think about practice, moving movement around the post, okay? It's really important. Um, the FIVB call this the optical position to see, okay? And what they mean by this is that you are able to identify what's going on, okay? So at the moment of service, you're able to identify position areas. So you need to be parallel to the court, facing the court, yeah, with the whole team in your view, yeah. You need to, you need to, when you move from from the the receive, receiving side when the ball arrives to the reception again, you need to stay parallel. Start being able to move from one side to the other parallel. Don't turn your shoulders, yeah, because as soon as you turn your shoulders, you've got something behind you, yeah, and you can't always pick things up. So do your best to keep that parallel movement. Okay. When you move to the reception side, be aware of the overpass off the service, particularly in the men's game, it can come very quickly. And therefore you get players that are attempting to block or attack 
straight away. So you don't have that time to see what's going on. You need to be there relatively quickly. Okay. Get a solid foundation and base to work from. Yeah. So when you're moving, don't run. You're moving relatively quickly, but you're not running anywhere. And you're creating a solid foundation to watch the play. You've you've seen where the ball's going and you know whether the block is going to be on the far side or near you. You've got that solid foundation. You can see all that you need to do to, to be able to determine within your jurisdiction whether there's a fault. If the attack is on the first referee side, take a step forward. Step into the post to get, get there. So you, I'm now focusing on the far side of the court. If the attack is on your side, you're going to have to take a step back. You might even have to take two steps back. Yeah. Um, but be able to take the play in without moving your head up and down. And be aware of balls that are passed near you. So that first pass off the service, the ball might get shanked out towards the um, towards the, the antenna on your side of the court, and a player may be running to recover it from the opponent's free zone. You need to make sure that you get out of their way. And the most and, and, the, and the, the place not to get out of their way is to is to move in the line of the ball. You need to be able to identify the players coming towards you and you either make an instant decision. If I go and stand next to the post, I'm going to be out of the way because the player can't run through the post. So they're not going to be hitting me and I'm not going to be in their way. Or if you can't get to the post, you're going to have to go backwards. And if the scorer's table is too close to you, then you could also have a problem there because you're just going to knock the score over. So work out which way you're going to go. But don't go in the line of the ball because you'll have the ball and the player chasing you and it doesn't look pretty. So just work out that one. Be aware of where it is. And when that ball does go into the opponent's free zone, make sure you're watching the contact because you're then looking to see whether it goes back outside the antenna. And the first referee is hoping, you know, that you're going to be there looking up, basically confirming that ball goes back inside. And it may be the case you haven't got four line judges. So, you know, you might not have line judge, um, line judge two, sorry, four, sorry, you might not have line judge four, they're doing that for you. There might not be anybody there. And line judge three is probably in the wrong position to do it. So you need to, um, you need to make sure you've got a, a solid place. So this is what I mean about sort of process of penetration and net contact, okay? So on the way, so, you're thinking about this from, from the second referee side. You're looking at the bottom of the net on the way up, the plane of the net on the way up, the net band before, during and after the faction of playing the ball, the player contacting the ball or not with the ball, the plane of the net on the way down, the bottom of the net on the way down, interference in the centre line, yeah, penetration, fine. And those seven points, bottom, side, top, top, side, bottom, floor. Every time, every attack, every time that you're there, you need to be able to sit, stand there and be able to see all of those without moving your head. That's what your aim is. That's what you're trying to do. So let's have a quick look, a, a look at um, a video. Uh, oh, that is So what 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 we need to, to we just go back to the start and just have a look at um I don't want to show all of this because it's a, a relatively long video, but it can be found on YouTube. It's um it's it's it was put this is um Nasser Shaban of uh, Egypt as this second report. Just look at his move. OK, so what what he's showing here is that. Um, when the ball is on the far side, he's moving forwards. 
and then he's, he's recovering his position when the ball's played and then moving sideways. And then he's moving forward or deciding whether he has to move forward or backward when the ball, when the next rally is. And then he's recovering his position and moving sideways. And through that way, he's able to make sure that he is always in the best position to see. OK, and this is the movement around the post that we talk about. It's forward and backwards. It's side to side and it's consistent. If you watch the ball during this action, you will miss things. And by that, we've got an example. Okay. Um, did you see the point at which he looked away? So let's just go back. Uh, on SD, Nick, at this stage, at least on my side, it's like one frame per second. It's very hard. Uh, okay. to yeah, sometimes the video doesn't show very well. You might have to, um, I'll, I'll give you a, um, a link as to where they are and you might have to watch them um, in a, a separate time. But what, what this video is actually showing is that at the point the net contact is made, Let's see if we can go back. See if we can play it again. It might. So I don't know whether you saw that, but but if you if you didn't, but we wait, hopefully you'll be able to see it um, later. At the point at which the net contact was, the second referee had looked to see whether the ball had grounded on the floor, and they looked away from the net. And by the time they looked back. They, they had not an, an understanding that there was a net contact because they were watching the ball and they weren't watching the net. So this is about making sure that you know your primary responsibility is always the net. Yeah, um, you could say, for example, that if you've, um, as a second referee, if you've had a good game, you haven't seen, seen the match. And the reason, the reason we say that is because if you're watching the net all the time, the, the great rallies, the great pickups, the great plays that happen, you're watching the net. You haven't seen them because you're not watching that. You're just watching this small two meter area around the net. Yeah. As plus as being aware of other things. Now, this is from the this this one is from the Olympics and um, uh, got a few um, things to see here. But this is um, I think this is either. Ning Wang of China or um, uh, um, now this must be the final, isn't it? I think if this is the final, then this is the um, this is Tano, the um, Japanese referee who is announced who was a very, very good second. Now just watch his movement when the ball comes towards him. So he's got a solid base. He's moved back because the ball's on his side. It's coming towards him. He's gone to the post and he's looking at the ball throughout so that the first referee knows that he is in control of the situation. Here's another one. He's seen the ball coming. He's immediately stepped forward to the post, so he's out of the way. And he's now looking at the ball contact. And this is, this is a, a, um, a, an excellent example of how to um let's go back to that one of how to do this this is he knows where the ball is and he's not in the way at all okay so the brazil player comes off he's seen the contact he's close to the net he knows whether it's going to be a problem with the antenna it's not so he's round to look at the block yeah again the ball comes straight to him so he's turned immediately to um to to, to move out out of the way and um, and therefore, it's another. This is unrelated video. Um, so so what that is trying to show is that's trying to show that when you see the ball coming, you've got enough time to don't let it be a surprise. Oh, the ball, there's a player. Oh, you know, because then you're going to either get in the player's way, and the player's going to start looking for a replay and all sorts of things. Yeah. So try and get out of their way, 
and then then the player makes a makes a, a chance to play the ball. Now we know rule change coming here um, that a player is not allowed to replay the ball from behind the opponent's bench. Now what that did say, sorry, outside the opponent's free zone, and that means the bench is outside the free zone by by definition. But it also meant the scorer's table. In actual fact, the rule is changing now that if the ball goes over the scorer's table or goes near the scorer's table, it can be retrieved from that position. But um, that's what that's just a minor change that's coming up. OK. Next big thing for us as referees, as second referees, is knowing the players' positions. OK, now you'll use all the information available to you to be able to track positions of players on the both teams. You have tactical knowledge. You recognise the reception positions, you know how the teams are lined up, you know who's front court, back court, you've got experience, your knowledge about the teams because you may referee them more often. You have knowledge about team members because you, you may see them, you may know them, you, you know whether they're middle, you know whether they're outsides, you know what position they're playing in. You've got lineup sheets and you've got the score sheet and all of that gives you information. But if you're looking at two teams that you don't know, and you don't have that experience of them, you don't have that knowledge about them and things. There are ways in which you can, can do it. And this is just one way. I'm just going to talk to this about this before, but it's just one way that you can remember whether your whether your teams are in the right places. Out. Um, the directing player is called the, the, the technique. It's called the directing player technique. If you identify where the setter is, on that you know it you know who the setter is. So in this situation, we've got um uh team serving, number one is serving, and on the reception side, we've got number one is the setter. You've already established that, you saw it through the warm-up, etc. You know number one is the setter. Okay. The um the way to remember where the setter is, okay, is that the player who is serving in the same position as the opponent's setter. When your team is serving, there is going to be one player who is always in the same position as the setter. And for the team on court A here, that is player number one. So when number one, wherever number one is on the court, when, when the team on court A are serving, they will be in the same position as the setter on court two for team B. So if you ever lose track of the setter, position on team B. All you need to do is to look at the serving team, serving team A, and identify where number one is, and that player will be in the right position for your set on the other side. And the reason that it works that way is because teams are very rarely out of position when they're serving. Very rarely do they get out of position when they're serving. It's, it, it happens, OK, rotational faults, etc. But in general, the players are well defined as to where which position they're in, and you can see quite clearly which position they 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 are holding when you're serving. It works the other way as well because you know that well, obviously when team B come to serve, yeah, player number five will rotate to four, and the setter on team A is at position four. So when they're receiving, the position the player at the setter number four, position four is going to stay at four yeah so when player five rotates and and number two goes to serve for team b number five is in the position of where the setter is so all you have to do when you're looking at your two lineup sheets before the start is identify right for team a directing player is number one team b it's number four and that way you can then work out where the setter is throughout the throughout the game if you lose track of where they are it's just one way to do it. it. Takes a bit of working out and, and thinking about, but I use it as a first referee and I use it as a second referee. Yeah. Just so that I know whether my setter, because when I'm a first referee, I want to know whether my setter is front court or back court. Yeah. That's what I need to know. And if I've got my directing players, I can have a quick look and go, right, I know from looking at the serving team, because I look at them more often than the reception team when, when service authorization goes on. I can look at the serving team and go, okay, number one's at five, setters at four, back court. And I, and I know that's how it's going to work. So this is just one technique. Yeah, you, there are others, but work out your, some people learn the pair pairings uh, uh, in a team and, and know 
where they are, what the pairings are, but it's 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 just one tip. Uh, can I just ask you a question, Nick? So uh, just to see if I understood well, does this method depend on both servers aiming to be in position one at the start of the game? No, it doesn't right. depend where they are. Right. No. Okay. So, so I didn't understand anything. So that's fine. But we I will watch it again. It's fine. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> just through. Yeah. The setter. The setter could be any in in any position. Um. Right. You you will you will find more often than not that on 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 certain certainties will all tend to start with their setters serving or their setter at one. It ha it happens quite a bit. So that instance, it's relatively easy. It's the other um the the reverse setter that you you're looking for. So in this one, it's just one that just have a think about it. It's just one one technique that you can do it. There are anomalous, you know, you may not get on with it, but I just put it that put it out there. Okay. Um so um so what we've got um so this is what the what it might look like on the court. So um we've got um our player number one that we saw in the in the in the rotation sheet on the lineup sheet, sorry. What did I say rotation sheet? God dear. Lineup sheet. Line of sheets at one. They've now moved to position number uh, to position um, uh, four. Okay, and therefore the setter on team B is also at position four. Okay, and similarly, number five, who was our player at number at position four, who's at position five, who's now moving to four. When they're when they're serving, yeah, with not with two going to serve, that player um, will be in the same position as the setter. So they've gone round to serve. So five when serving, four will be at one because five's at one, and that's how this process works and how it goes. So when you see it in the next one, when service goes back to team A, okay, the player number one or has moved from four to three, and therefore the setter stacking here that makes them look as though they could be at five, but actually no, they're definitely at um, at at three. OK, and that's the way to use it. Just one example. I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Substitution process and guidelines. So when a substitution occurs, you need to be between the net post and the scorer's table, but not obstructing the view. OK. Um, and you don't really you don't need to make the crossing of the arms signal anymore. Um, players tend to you, you do if they stand there and chat um, or aren't getting on with it. But in the in the um, in the senior game, the players are now now crossing relatively quickly. So as long as you can control that, then it's um, you, you don't need to do the crossing of the arms because by the time you cross the arms, the players have gone anyway. Just makes you look a bit more referees not up with the game. Um, but if they're standing there, then you might have to go. Come on, cross. Yeah. In the case of multiple substitutions, you need to wait for the scorer's hand signal. Already, if they're using wireless, that they've done the first substitution. And then they're ready for the second. OK. And similarly, if you get. Two sets of substitutions at the same time, you'll need to look at the scorer to make sure which way, which team they're looking at. Because you might be looking at the substitution on court B, and they might be recording the one on court A. And then you get a situation whereby this, the other substitution could have been missed completely. Or you think everything's going well, and you turn around to court A, and there's nobody there anymore. And you think, well, what's going on here? And you might not even have seen who the substitutes were. So you need in that situation to go, teams, right? Substitutes, wait. You might even have to whistle, stop, wait, scorer, which one are we doing? OK, and then clearly say to the one that you're not doing, you stand there and wait until we get to you. OK. So let's have a think about this. So the players are ready on the bench, and if your scorer is worth their salt, they may have seen that the players have got paddles already. So they might think, oh, hang on, I can see this. I can see which player is coming off because I can see what number the paddle is. So they're, they're waiting for it. And they might be able to look at the court and go, oh, OK, I get it. As soon as that player gets to uh, position two and they go and then they win the rally and go to one, there's going to be a substitution and they're going to the other player is going to come in to serve. That's a common one. Or you might have a setter that's backcourt 
And then you know that oh, as soon as the setter goes to front court, there's going to be a double substitution here because they're going to reverse the setter position. Yeah. So those things, hopefully, you've got an experienced scorer, they might have those already and expect that to happen. So they might be aware. Otherwise, as soon as the player steps into the substitution zone, you should the scorer should be announcing that with a buzzer. OK, if you in the NBL, you don't have an experienced score and that's not happening, you may need to whistle this. So as soon as the score, the player steps in, whistle or the buzzer. It depends what you've briefed before the start of the match. OK, so they're into the, into the substitution zone. They're ready with their paddle. They're ready to play. If they if they don't have um, the paddle or they don't have, they've still got their warm up shirt on or something else, then you can avoid the situation of having uh, a substitution denied and therefore rejected and therefore delay by stopping them entering in the first place. If you've got a double substitution coming to you and the one player is just about to step in the substitution zone and the other one's still in the warm up area, you can say to the player, you know, if you think, you know, it's going, it might be a double because you've heard the coach talking. You can stop the first player requesting the, the interruption until the second player is, is there. OK, but you need to do this by making sure that between the sets, you've re, you've, you're having a look at your benches. What's happening? Have I got timeouts? Have I got substitutions? OK, I've got a substitution coming. Nothing happening that side. OK, I know what I'm waiting for. Just quickly check to make sure I haven't changed the mind. Yeah, I'm still looking this way. Score, are you looking this way? OK, good. In comes the substitute. Everything's under control. OK. Don't get in the way of the scorer seeing what's going on. Yeah. If you have both teams requesting, again, make sure that you know which one is going first. Wait, please. And then when the score has finished the first one, they must say, I'm ready. Now we're going to have a look at the second one and authorise it again. Announce it and authorise it again. Yeah. Second time, and then everyone knows one substitute's finished, the next one is going to take. If you have multiple substitutions, remember they must come together, or the gap between them must be relative, must be really short. Now, most of the international players will know that the first substitution is going to take a little time, you know, a couple of seconds. So they may be a few paces behind because they know they've got to keep out of the way of the scorer. So they're not going to get in the way. They're not going to have two players stood next to you going, yeah, we're both going to go at the same time. Yeah, like, the, uh, you know, they will wait. So just have a look and, you know, are they close enough to be part of a multiple substitution? Yeah. And if they're not close enough, just stop the first one coming in until the second one's caught up. Yeah. And then you've got it. It's all legal. There's no problem. You're not going to get any delay warnings for just something which is just a procedural thing that you might be able to enforce. So when you've got a multiple there, just make sure that there's a, a, a clear gap between them. Yeah, we're looking this way. We've seen it. The first one, we've got it. Score, you've got it. Yes. Now the second one can come in and change. Don't allow the situation we've got here with um, two substitutions trying to go at the same time with the second referee in the way uh, or maybe a third arriving late. Yeah, that's because that third one's an improper request, remember. That we, so remember improper request, you know, um, requesting an interruption in play before players resume from a previous interruption in that substitution. OK, so it makes sense that just work around that situation, get used to it, know what you're looking at, know what you're doing with the score. Now, this is a bit of um, video. Now, this is not, um, I've not done this to, um, Show up um, full check. He is an outstanding second referee. Um, this is what can happen when clearly he can see that Netherlands are making a substitution and there is some doubt as to whether this player is involved or not. And this is what happens when um, the referee is looking one way and something happens behind them. OK, just let's just have this one place. And, and the communication between the second referee and the scorer here is, is um, OK. So the second referee's quickly looked at the scorer to say it's happening. Yeah, they've got them. OK. But on the other side, they've got. The other team has done theirs. And then there's some doubt as to who the pair was, and that's because the score has been distracted 
by what has happened on the Russia side. Okay, so what they're trying to now confirm is which were the pairs. Now, in this instance, they've got electronic scoring. Okay, so there is a tablet where both coaches should have sent the substitute to um, the, the scorer, but they may have got it wrong. Um, and we're told not to reject substitutions for incorrect um, uh, information being sent to the tablet. We have to um, delete the tablet information and do it manually. So in this instance, as you can see, the scorer has said, I didn't quite catch one of the substitutions. It was too quick for me to do both. And they just confirmed with the second referee, which was the player that came on and which one came off. And in that case, as a, as a second referee, all you need to do is just, you know, confirm what's going on. In the MVL, normally you're close enough to be able to talk to the scorer. So if you've got any doubts as to whether the score as to the scorer's ability to do these quickly, you need to say, right, we've got number five going on for number eight coming off, or five entering, eight leaving. Yeah, and be clear with them. And if you've got two sets make sure that the first substitution is finished before the second one has begun, and then you won't get any problem. Um, OK, so you need to know the rules which impact your duties outside of gameplay, OK, and what the things that you have to do. So improper requests and delays are an area where you can influence, yeah? You can influence it by making sure that you correctly inform with the number of interruptions used. You can encourage teams to return to court when they're being slow. You can encourage players, Libros, to make sure that they enter and leave the court through the Libro replacement zone. You can help substitutions. You can see an invalid substitution coming and you can stop it happening. You know, you can stop a late substitution, you know, uh, an improper request that's being an interruption which is being requested at or, uh, after the moment of authorization of service. Stop those happening. You know, give the coach enough time to say, right, coach, I'm looking at you. Do you want that time now? You know, it's possibly coming. You know which side it's going to be. Coach, you having that time out? No, too late. First referee is about to authorize service. Once you've gone back there, you can just put your hand out and say, no, sorry, you're too late. Yeah. If they, and in that way, you know, it's, I'm looking at you, take your chance. When I've stopped looking at you, there's no good running up to me and trying to say, oh, I said time out, I did a, yeah. You have to make sure that you use your, 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 your ability around the post to say, look, at, at, after a rally, one way of doing this, after a rally, you go to the side that's, that, um, yeah, you go to the side that um, get, get me, not train of thought here. Okay, so the side side of the of, of the fault. Yeah, so when you re when you then relax your position, look at the team that's not serving first, because if there's going to be a substitution or a timeout, it's most likely going to come from that side. Okay, it could do if the server is going to change, but on the other side. But it's this. So look at the reception, the team reception first. Okay, anything happening? No. Look at the um, serving team. Anything happening? No. Okay. Move back to your position, waiting for the next rally to start with the authorization of the service. And once you start moving forward, you can basically say to the coaches, "I'm not going to listen to anything that happens now. So if your players come or whatever, I'm just going to stop them. If you try and have a timeout and say too late, you know, get into that." routine of, of how you work around this situation so that you don't get situations whereby you've got a coach uh, waiting for the very very last moment they're waiting and waiting and waiting they seem to as soon as the server gets the ball the first referee should be whistling you know if the teams are ready and the server's got the ball you can authorize service so you get coaches that that know and they're waiting and waiting until they see that the server's got the ball and they're a timeout yeah and you go look you know, you've, you've had probably 10, 15 seconds up to that point to make that decision. That's just too late. It's not a race to see you can get the timeout signal in before the first referee's whistled. Because by the time you've seen it whistled, the first referee will have whistled in front of you. Yeah. And at that point, the first referee will go, no, I'm not interested. 
know, and if the team then decides to start leaving the court, then they're going to get a delay. Yeah, and, and things build from there. So try and get into your routine of letting the coaches know when you're ready for the information. Actively manage personnel in the control area. Yeah. You know, just just make sure that the substitutes are where the reserve players are on the bench or in the warm up area. Yeah. Make sure the assistant coach is sat on the bench. They're not standing up all the time. Make sure the assistant coach doesn't go wandering off because they don't take any part in the game. So they need to be sat on the bench all the time. Make sure the coach sits at the on the bench nearest you and they don't sit at the far end talking to a reserve player. You know, things like that. Just get into that routine of looking all the time what's going on. At um, maintain good working contact with the scorer. Every time out when you put your back to the post and you're facing the scorer, go over and make sure everything's okay. Yeah, have a look at the score sheet at the same time. You can say, oh, is everything okay? Yeah, yeah. At the same time, you're looking at the score sheet going, yeah, it looks like it's been recorded properly. Who are my servers, my server in position two again? Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, everything's good. Yeah. And by the time you get back to the post, you know, 25 seconds is up and you're almost thinking about restart, you know, getting them back on court. So if you get into a routine, you know, you're, you're, the timeout actually goes very, really quickly because by the time you've whistled the timeout, you've lost a few seconds there by the time you looked at your watch. Yeah, because that'd be two or three seconds after the, after the request, maybe five. Yeah. Uh, you've watched both teams come off the court, go to near their benches at the moment. Obviously, there's relaxation. They can be um, socially distanced if they wish. Um, you've seen that the current timeouts have started. Uh, everything's OK. Now go and talk to the score. By this time, you're at 15 seconds at least. Um, by the time you've asked the score, are they OK? You've checked the score sheet. You've, you've done 10 seconds. So by the time you get back, you've got five seconds left. So it's a couple of seconds there. Turn around, got everyone there, back to start. Blow your whistle, press your um, electron whistle, whatever it is, um, and, and back on the court. So just get into that that routine. Um, and when you identify, identify situations that could lead to sanctions, yeah? And if that happens, what I tend to do is I see what's going on. We've ended a rally. The first referee is going to talk to someone. I've seen what's going on. I then step backwards so I'm still watching the court all the time but I stand and I might move back and say to the scorer there's a sanction coming there could be a sanction coming be ready for it okay and then the scorer as long as they know what they're doing they should be then focusing on the sanction courts so that when the sanction comes you can then relay it straight away delay warning yeah just check they're recording it properly delay penalty uh, warning to a player penalty to a player whatever it is, what the number is, etc. Yeah, just give them that information. Be aware this might now happen. It might throw you a bit. So this is what's going to what's going to happen in the court. Things like that. At the end of the match, obviously you check the score sheet and you sign it. OK, um, shouldn't be any problem. Um, the the pre-match checks were correct, then Checking the score sheet at the end of the match should be straightforward. It's just making sure the scores have been written down properly. The players are sequential, but you've been looking at that all the way through the match, so you know it's right because you've been you've been doing it. You've been looking every time out, so you know the score sheet is going to be correct. Yeah. So um, again, supporting the supporting the score. So just coming back to working as a team, yeah, and. Um, and this is all about eye contact and making sure that you look at each other a lot. Um, because as a second referee, when I'm not looking at the net or the floor or the benches, I'm looking at the first referee. I'm looking at them pretty much all the time. Because if something goes wrong on my side, I need to be able to tell them to stop. And if I tell them to stop, I need them looking at me to tell them to stop. So if you don't look at your second referee very much, and they need to stop the match, then you can get the situation whereby you've just authorised service and the second referee is doing something. Might be doing, but they're doing something. They could be talking to the scorer, they could be dealing with somebody by the bench, they could be looking at the player in the warm up area, they could be doing something. If you're not looking at them, you can get into that situation. Then you've got to stop the rally, then you've got to replay it. Yeah. So, and as a second referee, so first and foremost, eye contact. Is there any information I need to give you? Yeah, and there could be situations whereby you're saying, you know, I've got I've got information, you know, all you need to do is ask for it. Or 
if I think I've got information that you need and you haven't asked for it, I'm coming over there and I'm telling you. If you've got communication, great, because you can talk to them. But if you haven't got communi communication at all, you need to get over there and give the information. Yeah, and say, I'm coming, okay? And, and working as a team, we'll always work as a team. Okay, um, make sure that you, you are looking, you're looking at the benches, you're looking at the substitutes, you're looking for time out requests, you're looking to see where the ball's gone. Um, you're doing all of this stuff and you're keeping everything on, the, on your side of the ticket. You know, it's really good and, and it's hard work. Second refereeing is hard work. Yeah, if you're doing it properly, it doesn't look as though you're doing much, but if you're doing it properly, you're working really hard. You're working hard every single point you're working hard because you've got so much to look at, so much to do, so much to get ready. And anybody that sees a second referee, say a second referee, that's nothing. You're just looking at that. It's not. There's a load of stuff to go in. OK. The first referee should always give the second referee and the score sufficient time to do their work. So do not rush. If you have to stop the match, you have to stop the match. It's better to stop the match than to plow on knowing that either you or the scorer could be wrong. Yeah. Stop the match. Make sure that you've got time to collate what you need to do. So, for example, you take a, an improper request, for example. Now, as a first referee, I don't know whether you have spoken to the scorer to record it or not. So let's, for example, say I've authorised service. There's a late request for timeout waved away by the second referee. Rally continues at the end of the rally. I'm expecting to see my second referee go and talk to the scorer because they're recording the input request. And then when they turn around to me again, and there's no signal for this, but I always use a use a cross fingered uh, sort of approach. If I'm second referee and I've recorded an improper request, I'm going to tell this. I'm going to tell the first referee I've recorded an improper request, because if it happens again, the first referee has got to issue a delay warning or penalty if it's at that point. So they need to know the first one was recorded properly. And if you don't record them. Then the first referee might be going, well, this is a delay penalty. And the team's going, what? What when when what happened there? And and you look at the score sheet and, and, and the improper request is not recorded. Yeah. So you, you need to have that communication to make sure that if the first referee says, no, this is an improper request, and you and I haven't and you go to the score, then you, between you, you need to communicate. So communication, eye contact all the time. You can do it. You can eye contact and, and give all the information without ever having to talk to each other. It, it is possible. And I think that is me to the end of what I had to show. So what we're going to do now is if we've got questions, I'm happy to take them. I can't always look at the chat as we go through. So if you've said something and it's gone and you want an answer to it, then um, just uh, stick your hand up and we'll, we'll deal, deal with it. Then. Yeah, sorry about the um, the frames on the videos. I will send a list of the videos that I've used. Um, there are a couple of casebook ones in there which are easy to find. You just download the casebook or look at the casebook online and all of the videos are linked. So they should be easy. If I found it off YouTube and, the, and, I, and I do do that in one or two of them, I'll send a quick um, email out with um, or, or I'll stick a slide on to the end of the uh, presentation and I'll send it out with that so that you've got the information. Uh, Nicholas. Yes, so th there is one thing in particular as a second ref. Um, I, I find it um, like a rewarding role, but um, uh, coaches, uh, coaches seems to be uh, like intent on asking lots of questions or making lots of remarks. My understanding is that they, they're not really, they, they don't have anything that they can or should be able to tell to you as a second ref. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Yeah. So and it's, uh, it's a general like, so what, what, what do we do when this happen? Because obviously we do not have any um, like kind of a discipline rights or, or things that we can do. So besides okay. ignoring them and saying stoic and, you know, and courageous, whatever. But. So, so, so one thing you can, you, can, you can get the first referee to know what's going on in a couple of ways. One way is to turn to the, turn to the coach and say, sorry, coach, you know, you can't talk to me through your game captain and you could in indicate the game captain. 
Mm -hmm. um, if it's persistent, you could just wander over to the first referee and say, look, this coach is just going on and on and on. Yeah. And then the first referee can can go either to the game captain if they're feeling if they're if they're feeling generous, they can go game captain. Can you please remind your coach that they are not to ask the second referee any questions? You come to me and with with any queries regarding the rules. Or they could say your coach is persistently um, talking to the second referee. You know they are not allowed to. This is a warning. Different ways of, of dealing with it. But as a second referee, if the if the if the coach is consistently um, asking questions or trying to influence you, you need to make sure your first referee knows. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with you at that point of going, coach, telling them to shut up or or go through the game captain. And then going over to the first referee and saying, look, can you please tell me, get this coach to, to control this coach for me? Because I can't. Yeah. yeah? Mm. Then any, anybody else got any um, thoughts or questions? Nacho. Uh, yes, thank you. So one of the things that I find uh, more challenging when, well, or difficult when uh, talking to the, f uh, communicating to the first referee is, uh, so if I'm second referee and a coach or a player or whoever um, comes to talk to me and um, make, uh, insults me, for example, yeah. calls me something, um, how can I tell the first referee whether he should issue um, a yellow card or a red card depending on what they said to me? OK, so I'll give you I'll give you my perspective as a first referee. Um, sure. If you came to me and said to me, this player has insulted me or whatever, then my initial instinct is I'm at penalty. But I will say to you. What what is your view? What 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 do you what do you see as the outcome? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I will say to you right now, Joe, you've told me what happened. What do you see the outcome to be? And you might say to me, it's a it's a penalty. And I go, correct. And I'll go, yes, I agree. It's a penalty. And then I'll issue the penalty. Yeah. So if you say to me, um, no, I think it's a warning, then I might say, are you sure? You know, and they say, well, if you, if you, you know, and, and decide then whether we're mm -hmm. at warning or at penalty, and then we'll, we'll de deal with it. If we think it's offen really offensive, it's offensive. It should be expulsion, of course. So it really does depend on, you know, we've got to a stage now where where you know players players would 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 find it, you know, um, if we went straight to expulsion, then we are within the rules. So we can do that if we want to. Yeah. yeah. Normally, sometimes you would probably go to penalty. It's I don't know. It's about standards and norms, isn't it, as to what you think is acceptable and is not acceptable. Yeah. Um, and this is this is one way you, you have to make a judgment as to where you are. Some people have a high tolerance level of this sort of stuff as to whether what people can say to them before they get upset. And some people have a very low tolerance level. Yeah. So, you know, it, different referees will respond in different ways. But if you go over and say, look, this player insulted me, um, my view is this should be a penalty or this should oh. be a expulsion, then the first referee should support you. You are deeply mature. Um, Nick, Glenn here. Um, just an addition to that, um, and, and it was because you said about a high tolerance, and I remember once, a very long time ago, um, having a chat with Dennis Lebris. You're, you'll definitely remember that name, right? And he said to me, I was first referee in a game, and he said to me afterwards when he was debriefing me, he said, Glenn, you do need to protect your other officials. So while we may have high tolerances, the other officials who are officiating with us may not necessarily have the same level of tolerance. And so we do need to be aware of that. And I think in that case, the protection of all of our officials has got to be top of mind also. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Tot totally agree with you. Yeah. OK, cheers. Thank you. OK. Rita? Is there a signal of some sort to indicate that you've, um, as a second referee, told the scorer to record an improper request? I've had it happen. I've rejected a substitution for whatever reason. 
and turned around to the scorer and said, it's an improper request. And the aim of the game is not to delay the game. No, no. So, so it was so, how do I convey that fact to the first referee without yeah. actually causing a delay to the game by trotting across yeah, and saying, I've just done an improper request. Well, there isn't a signal, is there, as such? Yeah, there, isn't, there isn't one, but I, I have my own official signal. Well, that's what I was getting at. Which is this. Official one. <laughs> so I have an unofficial signal which says, I've done the improper request, or I want you, you know, if I'm first referee and I look at the second referee, and I want, <laughs> I, I, I'll give that, and hopefully they, they might think, why is he crossing his fingers? And after a while, the, the penny might drop um, as to what I'm, what I'm on about. But um, but if but in that case, what you can do is is you can you can you can look to the first referee and say, well, I can come over and tell you, which you're fine to do. Yeah, and the first referee might go, yeah, I got it. I saw the yeah, improper. Yeah, fine. Um, I've got it, and then you don't. Then you know that they've they've seen it, or you know you can, um, or you you might just have to go over to them and say I recorded an improper request. Right, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah? Firstly, um, I've had the other way around. As first referee, I've rejected yes. something and said it's an improper request, and I've ended up actually calling out to the scorer there was an improper request because yes. I'm an inexperienced second referee, one hasn't yeah. got a clue what was going on. You know, to make sure it was recorded. That's fine. Absolutely fine. As long as you've got the information across and it's been recorded. We know that we know there's not a, um, you know, I think a lot of the things is now there's a general assumption that because obviously in the international and, and top club games, the, the referees are invariably uh, have audio communication tools, that all of this information is passed between them all the time anyway. And therefore, you know, we don't see referees talking, you know, physically going and spit standing next to each other. Apart from that time, you know, where there's a, a complete breakdown in communication, you know, like we, we talked about with the first referee when we saw that situation with the uh, substitution with um, the Peruvian referee and the Russian referee that just couldn't com communicate the right words. And they actually had to go and stand next to each other to actually try and get the point across and they still couldn't communicate. So, um, you know, but there's a general view that, you know, you don't do this walking across the court business because you, you, you communicate it all through 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 the mic um, but if you haven't got that and the only way of telling them is to walk over there is you've got to walk over them it's not a long discussion is it you just have to get over there and say improper request for the um, rejected substitution full stop yeah thank you very much move on yeah so that's how that's how i do it yeah but just don't be afraid to do it don't you know okay but if there's um, if there's no more questions, then um, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you very much for for uh, taking part in these sessions. They are um, they I, I find them I find them really worthwhile because they help me order my thoughts about um, uh, the rules and also your feedback also makes me think about my interpretation and about how I go about refereeing. So, um, so thank you very much for all the time that you put into this. Um, and I hope that that was of some um, benefit to you. Um, and uh, I hope that I apologize for the um, uh, problems at the start, that um, I will uh, have that all sorted out for next time. So next time we're gonna talk about the scorer and scoring. So um, if you are an ace scorer and think you know everything, then um, maybe I should get you to present it. Um, <laughs> But, um, I'll, um, we'll, we'll do we'll do scoring and the the score sheet because some some of you will be um, uh, will be new to it and uh, need to know your way around it and what you're looking out for with the scorer and we'll consider what the scorer needs to do within their responsibilities as well um, with, without obviously going over all the rules that we've talked about before. Okay, so that'll be next time, um, probably in a couple of weeks, so maybe two weeks from today. I don't know what that, no, that won't, is that the 9th, uh, 20th? Yes, possibly the 20th, um, but it will come out from Stuart anyway, um, as to um, which date it is with the, with the information.